Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. This week, we are honored to host Lieutenant General Eric Kenny, Commander of the Royal Canadian Air Force, as part of our Air and Space Commander Series that we execute throughout the year. I think that all of our listeners know that the Royal Canadian Air Force is one of the Air Force's and Space Force's closest partners. We've gone to war together time and time again, going all the way back to the dawn of air combat in World War I. U.S. pilots seeking to fly and fight in World War II prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor normally joined through the Royal Canadian Air Force, and the past decades are filled with numerous allied partnerships between our two nations. Given that we share the same continent, we are fundamentally aligned when it comes to the Northern Tier Defense Mission, something that is more relevant than ever given the adversary activity we are seeing in the Arctic. Canada is a key NORAD partner, it holds a very special place in the U.S. Homeland Defense Mission. This cooperation also extends on orbit with the Royal Canadian Air Force and Space Force closely aligned, especially given the new Memorandum of Understanding that's in play. Well, now, before we introduce Lieutenant General Kenny, I'd like to welcome our very own Lieutenant General David Deptula to the episode. He's going to share the mic on this episode with me with the general. So, General Deptula, welcome. Yeah, Slick, it's uh, great to be here this morning and always good to talk to our allies but this is an incredibly fortuitous window, given the Royal Canadian Air Force selection of the F-35 as their next modern fighter, in the space uh, memorandum of understanding that you also mentioned. Now, I got to tell our audience that I've fought and flown with airmen from the Royal Canadian Air Force for decades, and I got to say, you'll be challenged to find a more professional force. So with that, let me welcome you, Lieutenant General Kenny, and thanks very much for taking the time to join us today. Well, thanks very much, uh, Lieutenant General Tapula, as well as Slick, for having me here today to talk about the Royal Canadian Air Force. So, General, first, could you paint a picture of what the Royal Canadian Air Force looks like these days? For our audience, tell us a bit about how big you are from a personnel perspective, how many bases you have, what are your primary missions, so on and so forth. Yeah, thanks for the question. Maybe I'll start with a broader perspective as I go around and talk to our aviators, and as I talk to Canadians, I talk about three things. One is that we live in a dangerous time. Things are very challenging within the Royal Canadian Air Force. And lastly, they're also very exciting, and I'll speak to that in the next portions of the podcast. So what do I mean by that? Dangerous in terms of we see at the one-year anniversary of the Russia invasion, illegal invasion of Ukraine, the state-on-state -state conflict is a reality, and that there is adversaries who very much do not want to follow the rules-based orders. And therefore, we need to be prepared as a military, as a defense and security team, to be able to deal with not only the current situation, but future situations that we foresee. When I talk about challenging, the challenges that I'm having right now in the Royal Canadian Air Force is having enough people to take on not only the current operations, but all the new capabilities that we're bringing in to the Royal Canadian Air Force. The pandemic has hit us quite hard and reduced our numbers. And we're working actively to recruit a higher number of folks so that we can actually do our job effectively. And then finally, it's exciting because we are modernizing almost all of the Air Force capabilities. The Air Force of 2035 will be completely different than the Air Force of today for the Royal Canadian Air Force. In fact, we're bringing in many new capabilities that we've never had before. So if you think of the Air Force 2035, and I use that very deliberately because that's when we'll be full operational capability on all the projects that are currently approved and funded, except for a few space projects, which will take me a little bit longer, that team will be a very modern, effective Air Force that will have an operational advantage against our adversaries. But I need to bridge the gap between our current personnel situation to bring in these new capabilities to make sure that we have an effective force. So I'm privileging the future Air Force in the day-to-day -day fight. 
Now, speaking more generally about the Royal Canadian Air Force, we have about between 17 and 18,000 positions in the Royal Canadian Air Force. And I say about because it's changing here as we're growing our Air Force, getting in new capabilities. That is broken down into regular force, or what's seen here in the U.S. as active duty, our reserve force, as well as our public service civilian employees. At the current time, we're at about 15,000 people filling those positions. The vast majority of our shortages are in the active duty or regular force, as we describe it, as well as some reserve force members. My headquarters is located in Ottawa, Ontario, a team of about 500, and I have four direct reports to me. Three of them are divisions, and one of them is an aerospace warfare center. One Canadian Air Division is located in Winnipeg, Manitoba, just north of North Dakota. And that is our headquarters that generates and delivers air power every single day. There's 11 wings that report to that commander. That commander is a two-star. That commander has many roles beyond generating air power. is also the Joint Force Air Component Commander for all operations within Canada and around the world. And that person is also the commander of the Canadian NORAD region. So not only does he provide the forces, he also employs the forces. Two Canadian Air Division, also located in Winnipeg, Manitoba, is my training establishment and training authority. They do all ab initial training for all our occupations to bring them up to train effective strength and then hand them over to one Canadian Air Division to generate employer power. Three, and they have three wings, sorry, underneath them. And then three Canadian Space Division, newly formed, on 22 July last year, as we recognize the importance of the space domain, it's located in Ottawa, Ontario. It has 100 people currently and growing to 175. There'll be a 50-50 split between military and civilian, and it is a joint force within that military comp. There is Army, Air Force, Navy, and Special Forces, and that will stay that way going forward. They have one wing underneath them, and they generate and employ space power. And then finally, as I mentioned, the fourth component, which is our Aerospace Warfare Center, which is located in Trenton, Ontario. They do our concept development, conceived design aspects, as well as our doctrine. And they have a couple squadrons underneath them to do operational test and eval, and as well to do adversary support. So that's the composition of our Air Force as it stands right now. In terms of some of the missions that we do, each day we do search and rescue. So all aeronautical search and rescue within Canada is done by the Royal Canadian Air Force. We have a mix of fixed wing and rotary wing search and rescue aircraft. We do the NORAD mission with fighters on alert, as well as air defense sector and an air ops center to control that, air mobility throughout Canada and around the world. Beyond that, unlike some other air forces, I also am responsible to generate maritime as well as land-based air support. So on the land side, I have a tactical aviation capability, Chinooks and Bell 412s that I generate for the Canadian Army primarily support as well as some with the special forces on the navy side i have maritime patrol aircraft and maritime helicopters that support the navy in the anti-submarine warfare role primarily and then i also have fighters that i can deploy as required around the world with the air to air fueling capability all controlled by our air operations center which is located in winnipeg what i take away from that is in canada you own all the air assets We own all the air assets except for some of the smaller UAVs that the Army Navy Special Forces have, as well as some helicopters that we have provided to our Special Forces Command. We we generate the pilots and the maintainers to go there, and we're about to bring in with Special Forces a capability to do intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, twin-engine aircraft, which we will provide the pilots for and the sensor operators for, but it'll actually be owned by the Special Forces, a total of three aircraft. That sounds like a good organizational arrangement that perhaps the United States might learn from one day, but that's a discussion for another podcast. Over to you, Slick. Yeah, sir, I appreciate that. As you both were just talking, it made me realize all the way back to my personal experience going through pilot training where my flight commander at Shepard was a Canadian F-18 pilot, uh, Sleepy Cottrell, who was my flight commander. I flew a bunch with him and learned a ton. And being a a class leader, not only did I fly from him, but I learned a lot about leadership. And then you just realize, uh, to General Deptula's point, how closely aligned we are with our allies, especially Canada. So it's just really neat to have you here and to talk through some of the things. And I can't remember a time that I've 
have done a red flag or been deployed to where the Canadians weren't there. So, and I really just want to use that example because we know what we are doing in the United States Air Force. So can you talk to us about your operating tempo? You all were obviously key players over the past two decades in Afghanistan and the fight against ISIS. So where else do you find yourselves deploying and what are the main drivers in play? Thanks. Like, first off, I, I do know Sleepy very well. Our force is not that large as you compare, obviously, to the U.S. Air Force. And so we tend to know many of the folks within our Royal Canadian Air Force. And my background is as a fighter pilot. And so I, I know Sleepy, who was also a fighter pilot. So our operational tempo, like everybody else, is very high, compounded by the fact that we're short of people, as I mentioned early on. One of the things that we do, that we have to do every day, Besides the NORAD mission, having an alert aircraft available to do aerospace warning and aerospace control for the binational command of NORAD is that search and rescue capability. We have across five bases in Canada, a combination of rotary wing and fixed wing aircraft, and very proud of that team and the search and rescue technicians that will be dispatched to retrieve and ideally save those that require help when they're in distress. Air mobility fleet is flat out right now moving equipment, people around the world, in particular to Europe, to support efforts in the Ukraine, whether it's donations. We're getting ready to fly some tanks over, to which will be donated to Ukraine in a relatively short order with our C-17s. So because of the tempo and the, the personnel shortages, we're consolidating and focusing our efforts where it provides the greatest effect. As an example, I had an air mobility detachment in Kuwait supporting operations in Iraq. We've now consolidated that into Europe. And from there, doing a hub and spoke type operation, we'll we'll go to Kuwait as required to support operations in Iraq or around the Middle East. Their primary purpose right now is to provide non-lethal and lethal aid donations for countries within Europe. As close as we get to the Ukraine to be delivered to the Ukraine, they've moved over 6 million pounds of cargo since they arrived shortly after the invasion occurred about a year ago. And they've been doing that for multiple nations throughout Europe. As well, we're using that team to go down to Africa to do UN support, primarily out of moving equipment within that area to provide support as required. Our CP-140s, which uh, would be referred to as P-3s, we call them CP-140s, are often deployed doing the ASW anti-submarine warfare role in the Atlantic. We've also been sending them times a year to Japan to do UN Security Council resolution enforcement against North Korea for transfer of specific arms or cargo that is not allowed to be there. We're also using them often in Europe to provide an anti-submarine warfare capability, and they're currently down in um, Carousel right now supporting Joint Interagency Task Force South as we look to interdict drug runners that are moving narcotics from South America upwards here to the U.S. Our CH-148, which is our maritime helicopter, is currently deployed on one of our frigates, moving its way to the Mediterranean right now. And we just got back from doing two sails with two of our helicopters going through the South China Sea and working in the Indo-Pacific region. And finally, our air task force that was in Romania doing enhanced air policing for NATO with our F-18s just returned after a four-month deployment. That was our seventh year in a row in Romania, doing enhanced air policing four months each time. And they've come back at the end of December time frame. And that's a contribution that helps with NATO in terms of the reassurance that we can provide. So those are some examples of things that we're doing. And I didn't, of course, mention response to disaster relief, floods, fires that occur every year within Canada that we respond to in coordination with our land forces or naval forces as required. Well, thanks for that. It sounds like you're a busy force. Now, before we get to talking about hardware, which is obviously a big interest point for our audience, what about your personnel? In the U.S., we spend a lot of time talking about what it means to develop a 21st century airman or guardian, especially uh, one who will excel in the digital environment, but still know how to fall back on time-tested manual skills. How are you looking to develop your human capital in the Canadian Air Force? So within the Royal Canadian Air Force, we refer to them as aviators. And really, it all comes down to people. We're going to get new equipment, new capabilities. We're looking to integrate it all. But unless we have the people that are trained, that are motivated, and that are ready to do the mission, we will not be successful. So... My main focus as one of my four objectives in my new strategy of being released shortly 
is making sure we value our people and invest in their future. So this is about professional development, military education, talent management, and succession planning to make sure that they are able to thrive in a complex, uncertain environment. What we want to do is be able to provide that professional education so that when they are out in the field doing operations and they have my intent or the commander's intent that they're serving at the time, that they're able to flex and be agile, integrated with their partners to ultimately have an operational advantage over our adversary. It's easy to say, but it requires a lot of work. I think one of the reasons why we're seeing Ukraine so successful against Russia is the professional development that we've Canada's helped with as well in development since the 2014 invasion to make sure that they are a thinking force, especially in the non-commissioned member corps or enlisted corps, that allows them to take intent and move quickly on a conscripted force who does not have that training and waits for orders to be given and therefore is not able to quickly react. So that's what we want to do is we want to make sure that we can have that professional force which takes for the Air Force anywhere from three to seven years, depending on the occupations we're talking about, to get them to a point where they're truly contributing and able to give back that experience. And that speaks to making sure that we're focused on retention. As we see changes in the demographics, expectations for work-life balance and job conditions, and there's many things that we need to get at so that we can have an effective force that focuses on its mission. And the last piece I'm really working on is inclusion. We need to have an environment that is considered safe from a, each person's perspective where members bring their best selves to work, an organization that is diverse, diverse in thought, diverse in the people that we bring in. If we all value each other's opinion and we allow a full complement of members to come in from different backgrounds, we will make more effective decisions and ultimately will give us that advantage that we need moving forward. So inclusion is a big focus within the Royal Canadian Air Force and within Canadian Air Forces. Yes, sir. I do want to ask a question about something you mentioned in the opening. You've got a ton of modernization efforts in play. So can you walk us through them? And I'd love to start with the F-35 because it's been making a lot of headlines. And what's the status of the Hornet fleet right now? And how do you expect to on-ramp the F-35? So I probably can talk for a couple hours on all the modernization efforts. I'll try to constrain myself here (laughs) to a few things. I'll start with the Hornet fleet. So we received F-18A and B models in the early 1980s. We were one of the first countries to actually take delivery of the F-18 when it came out. So that aircraft now is onwards of 40 years, and our current modernization efforts that we've put into the F-18 fleet will bring it to 2032. So it'll be a 50-year-old aircraft at that point. So what are we doing to make sure that we're able to effectively transition the F-35, we're investing in two components to our F-18s. One, which is ongoing right now, is to update the avionics to make sure it's interoperable, whether that's ADS-B, Mode 5, updates to our GPS, some crypto requirements, to make sure that we can effectively operate that in a coalition. And then a more significant effort is 36 of those 88 aircraft will be fitted with an APG-79 EASA radar. We already have two of them down in the States doing some testing. Uh, we're putting on those as well, some AIM-120 Deltas, AIM-9Xs, and JSAO Joint Standoff Weapon, to give it a capability that will be able to do cruise missile defense in relatively short order. By the end of this year, we expect six of them to be at initial operational capability. We're working very closely with the U.S. Marine Corps, who's doing a very similar effort on their F-18s. And then by the summer of 2025, All 36 aircraft are projected to be complete and on the line. And we'll be using that a lot for our NORAD mission, but if required, we'll be able to deploy it as well for international operations. So that allows us to go from a current 4-gen aircraft to a 4-plus with the Acer Raider M120 to then transition to F-35. So we're actually doing several transitions, just to be clear, as we modernize our F-18, go to what we call Hornet Extension Project 2 with the Acer Raider, then into the F-35 F-35, we're purchasing 88 F-35s. The first aircraft being delivered in 2026. We're starting with the lower numbers of deliveries of the first few years because we need time to build the infrastructure, security, information management, and IT backbone that we need in Canada to properly take them so that they can be effective within Canada. So we're going to take delivery of four in 2026, currently projected in the first quarter of that year. 
and they're going to be flown right to Luke Air Force Base, where we're going to send our pilots, and they'll start their training on the F-35. 2027, we're taking delivery of another six, once again, brought to Luke Air Force Base. And then in 2028, another six, the first two going to Luke for a total of 12, and then after that, the remaining four will go up to Canada. That's when we expect to have the infrastructure in place. And then each year after that, for the four successive years, all the remainder of the 88 will be delivered, and we see shutting down one squadron at a time of F-18s and doing a full transition to F-35 for a total of five squadrons. We have four operational squadrons, two in the west, two in the east, and one training squadron. Our pilot training will initially be at Luke, but eventually it will be repatriated back to Canada, and then our maintenance technician training will be done in Eglin Air Force Base starting around 2027, and we anticipate shutting down our first Hornet squadron around 2027 as well as we do this transition. That is the plan, and we'll see how that unfolds in the years to come, and that will then time us with having all those squadrons in place, all F-35 delivered by 2032, which is the planned retirement date for the F-18s, although we will be retiring some prior to that time as we start the ramp up to F-35. So that's one project which was just announced, and obviously a huge investment, and really will set the conditions to move us into a fifth-generation Air Force and really is leading our Department of Defense in terms of what we need to do after, from security, information technology, information passage, intelligence surveillance, reconnaissance perspective. And it's going to be exciting, an exciting time with a lot of effort still to be expended to get us there. And that will also, one of the reasons that we're, although it's taken us a while to get here, I'm also excited to see that we'll be getting the Block 4 F-35. So by buying the Lot 18 and beyond, that'll be a Block 4 F-35 capability that we'll be taking on. Some of their modernization efforts, we'll talk to some of them. I would say that we're also looking at everything from weapons to command and control to tanker capability to RPAS capability and uh, and space capabilities. And I think we'll, we'll maybe touch on some of those a little bit later on in this podcast. But it's, it is certainly an exciting time. And people ask me what I spend my time on. I spend my time on people and projects. Well, thanks very much for that. And congratulations on the F-35 decision and plan. It's great that we'll be partners, I think, for sure, that'll bring not just our Air Forces, but our nation's closer together. You mentioned, just in passing, the remotely piloted aircraft system initiative, your UAV acquisition effort. Could you talk to us a little bit about what's driving that and what kind of capabilities that you'd like to instill in the force? So the remotely piloted aircraft system is the name of our project, RPAS, and it's to provide a long-endurance ISR capability, which has global reach as well as kinetic strike capability. We started this project out a few years ago, and we are currently in the finalization phase of this project, working with one qualified supplier who submitted a bid with an ideal solution reached here by the end of this year. So what is it going to give us? It's going to give us capability to do three lines of task of ISR with long endurance connect strike capability UAS. And it's going to be located in the west coast and east coast of Canada. So the west coast will be Comox, British Columbia, east coast, Greenwood, Nova Scotia. Controlled by air crew that will be located in Ottawa and central Canada and our national capital region. And these aircraft will be used to provide sovereignty patrols, sovereignty presence within Canada, fishery patrols, but also will be used for expeditionary operations with up-to-strike capability throughout its time. Assuming we have a successful conclusion of this project here in the upcoming year, the intent is to have first deliveries in 2025-2026 and initial operational capability between 2027 and 2029. I give that large window because it depends on what we see here in the bid that's ongoing right now. This is something that's new for the Royal Canadian Air Force. We have not had this capability before. and The capability we're looking at will be able to fly in all controlled, uncontrolled airspace. So it's something that... We're looking forward to, and it's going to be a significant uplift of effort just due to the fact that we're not just switching out a capability, we're bringing in something we've never had before. Very good. Yes, sir. You guys are really ramping up, and Doug and I were, uh, I don't know, the last time we were at Lockheed Martin, but we saw a lot of Canadian tails going through the F-35 plant on the finishing side, getting ready to come off the line. So you guys are right there. 
And we know that you are looking at a new tanker buy as well. So as I understand it, you guys are looking at a version of the Airbus 330, the MRTT or multi-role transport tanker. Can you talk to us about that? So that's our strategic tanker transport capability project. They call it the STTC. Initially, it was designed to provide three lines of task to do air to refueling as well as air mobility, passenger and equipment movements around the world. We did an initial look at who could provide capabilities and what came back was the A330-200 MRTT was the most viable solution set for Canada. Last June, our Minister of Defence announced a program called NORAD Modernization, which provided us additional funding and additional projects, specifically 14 more projects for the Air Force funded to implement in the coming years. Part of that was additional STTC capacity and funding. So what do I mean by that? So the initial project was going to be five to six A330 200s, three lines of task. We've received funding for two more lines of task. So what we envision now is a fleet of up to nine A330 200 MRTTs to replace our current five A310s, of which only two are air refueling capable right now. So we're almost doubling the size of our fleet, not to mention that the A330 is 50% bigger than the A310. We're expecting a final contract award this year and initial deliveries. The first two are actually arriving this summer. And those are used aircraft that we bought that are five years old as a starting point. They will be passenger configuration only as we need to wait to get into the line to be modified to the MRTT with Airbus which is typically about a three-year wait time. So by, the, by this year, I'm anticipating an announcement and contract for up to nine total. That'll be a mix of probably new and used that will then have to go through the MRTT line and then provide us a capability initially from a passenger perspective and then eventually a tanker perspective. Our team is talking about 2029 to have the initial operational capability with a full tanker. I'm, I'm working hard to move that to the left and get it a little bit earlier than that, as I think there's many opportunities there, and I definitely need air to refueling. The, one of the big changes that we're going to see with this project that came with the NORAD modernization announcement and funding is our A310s that we have right now are based in one location in Canada. They provide some air to refueling support for transatlantic, transpacific, and local training, but they don't hold a posture for the NORAD mission. And we work very closely with the U.S. Air Force and guard to provide that capability for us. So with the NORAD modernization announcement, what we will see with up to nine aircraft is they're going to be located at two bases, one in the west, one in the east, and they're going to take on the air to refueling and posture for NORAD, for the Canadian NORAD region, so that we have a standby crew that can launch to support our F-35s, F-18s initially. It'll be able to do probe and drogue and boom capability and we'll also have the capability to do air refueling training, transatlantic, transpacific, and passenger movement. So it's a, it's, an, it's a big project for us, delivering relatively quickly and almost doubling the size of our fleet from our current A310s. Thanks for that. Are you also looking at a new training aircraft? We are. Future aircrew training is the program that we have in place right now. That's also undergoing review. So we've just received the two bids that just closed out. So we're doing a bid review right now and hope to have a contract or plan to have contracts, sorry, in place by the summer of 2024. That is to replace our current system of pilot training, air combat system operator or navigator training, and our aerospace electronic sensor operator training. So three different trades in the Air Force air crew. This will be a, a program that provides acquired services for 25 years to do training of those three trades. The, the program is envisioned to be four to six different types of aircraft. And I say four to six because the bids just came in, so we have to see what they say. And up to 75 aircraft. That will completely change out all our current fleets. And we'll start that first aircraft training is anticipated to be about 2027 or 2028 time frame and uh, which is when our current contracts are running out for the aircraft that we have right now to do training so a completely new training system and with the SART acquired services program what's given to the contractor that will win this is a certain number of pilots 
navigators, air combat system operators, and electronic sensor operators that have to be produced per year with a rheostat that I can turn up and down as required. Many of the services provided will be contracted, so many of the instructor pilots, as an example, or instructors will be contractors, which is different than our current model, which is primarily military members. We will have some military members within that training program, of course, but we're looking at up to 75% of the instructors being contractors as we bring that in. So what we're not getting after with that is our fighter lead-in training. And I ha- we had to wait. So we had to wait to see what our future fighter was going to be. So it's F-35. I have to wait to see what we'll be doing our pilot training. And like I said, 2024 will be that contract award. So on the heels of that, we're working on a fighter lead-in training program, future fighter lead-in training program, which is also funded. And we plan to have that in place by 2030. So we will be picking an aircraft that will do take the new wing grad that comes off of the basic pilot training course, converts them to be ready to go to the F-35. Right now we're doing that with the Hawk aircraft, which is running out of life and will stop in 2024, so next year. So between 2024 until we get this up in 2031 or 2030, we're calling it Bridge Fighter Lead-In Training. We're going to primarily work with NJEP on the T-38, which we've already been a part of, and we're going to bolster our numbers there. I'm also sending some pilots over to the International Flying Training School in Italy. We've just sent an instructor there, and we'll be sending two pilots there, as I need to have an ability to increase my numbers of pilots that are trying to get to the fighter stream, depending on what's happening with any particular program, and I'm working with some other nations to see what we can do. So for a six- to seven-year period, we will outsource to do that fighter lead-in training, and then we'll bring it back to Canada in about 2030 time frame. Yeah, so you guys are really, really getting after it, it sounds like. And I want to shift gears just a little bit because you mentioned it in in July of 22, really focusing on space. So the Royal Canadian Air Force is also charged with handling your national security space missions as well. So can you walk us through how Canada views that domain right now? In the U.S., we're very cognizant that our adversaries have chosen to contest space. And for us, that's what's driving the major changes in how we consider operations on orbit. So where's the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force on all of this? I'll start by saying that we're very aligned with the U.S., as well as our key allies in the Five Eyes and beyond, in terms of where we see the space domain. I was fortunate to host General Saltzman, the Chief of Space Operations, as well as General Dickinson, the Commander of U.S. Space Command in Ottawa, Ontario, a couple weeks ago. Both of them came separately, and we spent a day and a half with each to talk through what we're doing in Canada from a space perspective ensure that we continue our strong collaboration within the space domain. I think in the past, and and for many, they they believe that the space domain is a peaceful domain and one that is safe from threat, but that is not the reality. We see very clearly with the Ukraine invasion and with some of the testing that's been ongoing and overt strikes that have occurred by Russia, that the space domain is at risk. And... We have built our force, and I'm going to use some of the the thoughts that I heard from General Saltzman and General Dickinson during their visits. We we have built our force with the assumption that we will always have access to weather data, SATCOM, GPS, or other capabilities that we get through space. Missile warning would be another example. If we assume that we will have full access to space then we have right sized our force but if we don't have access to space then all of a sudden our force composition is not the force that we need to move forward so what does that mean that means we need to defend and protect space and canada when we released our defense policy in 2017 clearly stated that we are in the defend and protect role in the space domain and we just clarified that again in a policy document that we released last year and that's reassuring for many of our allies to include the U.S. as we work as part of the Combined Space Operations Team, which includes seven nations now. We were one of the original signatories on that. And most recently with Germany and France that have been added to it, so a total of seven nations with the Five Eyes. Working collaboratively, I think one of the reasons why Canada has been so involved in space is through the NORAD agreement. We have had members down in the U.S., throughout the U.S., who have been filling positions primarily in missile warning, but in other roles ever since NORAD has started. And so it's built a space expertise within the Royal Canadian Air Force that we've imported back into the three Canadian Space Division. But ultimately, what we wish to pass on to to those that will listen is that 
everybody has a responsible behaviors in space and that we treat space for peaceful use. But the reality is our adversaries don't see it that way. And we need to be able to protect our capabilities in space, degrade others if, uh, if so required, to make sure that we have an operational advantage. Now, you recently signed a memorandum of understanding with the U.S. about national security space operations. And as I understand it, it mirrors the agreement that we have with the U.K. Would you mind explaining it a bit to us? So I signed the Enhanced Space Cooperation Memorandum of Understanding with General Dickinson when we were in New Zealand at the beginning of December at the Combined Space Operations Principal Board. This is something that we've been working on for some time, and yes, very much in line with what the UK has done, and I know Australia is working on it as well. This is about better sharing of information, better integration of capabilities, understanding what one can provide that supplements another, uh, so we don't duplicate efforts. We have been partnered very closely with the US Space Command and US Space Forces as it stood up. And most recently, I sent a colonel down into US Space Command, and this memorandum of understanding will provide that individual additional access within US Space Command, and US Space Command will be sending us in 06 here shortly to 3 Canadian Space Division to be the deputy commander of that division. So this speaks to some of the collaboration that we're doing in this MOU allows us to uh, strengthen our deterrence and improve our resilience when it comes to space capabilities. And I'm very excited that we were able to do that. And I know that Australia will be doing that shortly. Well, General, I wanted to hop in here. You covered a lot of modernization priorities in the air domain. So what are you guys doing for space? Quite a bit. One of the focus areas, and I, I asked both General Saltzman and General Dickinson when they're visiting us, what what are some of your priorities when it comes to space and the one thing they, they talk about is space situational awareness or space domain awareness. And Canada has been doing that for a long period of time, currently with a SAFIRE satellite that provides and feeds into that 10 space situational network aspect. And we also have the Raider Constellation mission, Raider Sat, which provides us synthetic aperture radar, maritime domain awareness at a global level. In fact, we're using it to support some of the Ukraine operations that are ongoing right now. Those are not owned by the Royal Canadian Air Force or by the military. They're projects that we've partnered with, our Canadian Space Agency or MDA, different space industry organizations. We are now bringing in capabilities that will supplement what we have. So the Sapphire is a satellite that has reached its life and needs to be uh, replaced. It's still working at this time. So we have Surveillance of Space 2 project, which will put three ground-based optics tracking systems into Canada in about 2026. And then we're going to be launching a satellite to complement that in 2030. We want to get the optics up and running as quickly as possible to make sure that the Sapphire, which is currently approaching the end of life, as I mentioned, if it was to go, we still at least have ground-based optics until we get that satellite up. And then we have two other big projects, and they're, they're significant lifts for us. One is Defense Enhanced Space Surveillance from Space Project. And this is a SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar Satellite Constellation in the low Earth orbit that will give us an ability to watch the approaches to our coasts and our, to our nations to make sure that anything on the main maritime side in particular that's moving towards Canada can be tracked. But it actually will give us a global option to provide information across the globe as to what's happening on the ground. And we're partnering with others to provide additional capabilities on that one. And then we have the Enhanced Satellite Communication Project Polar, which is a high Earth orbit constellation that will provide us classified, encrypted, secure, narrowband, high band capability for SATCOM from North 65 to North 90 in the Arctic, which we don't currently have. So I've flown many times up there and... Unless you're near a North Warning system, you don't really talk to anybody in an F-18. This will give us an ability to be able to talk to our, all aircraft up there that have access to it. When I said earlier on that the Air Force of 2035 will be completely different except for a couple projects, these two projects are currently slated, the last two I mentioned, in 2035. And so I'm, I'm hoping we can move those ones a little bit quicker. Yeah, space isn't cheap. This discussion does bring up another key area. 
because it, it relates to space a lot. And that's what we're calling in the United States a joint all domain command and control. What's the Canadians Air Force's thinking on this? Are, are you building a similar capability or integrating with the US and your other allies in this digital endeavor? We've been partnered in this endeavor very closely with the U.S., both on the S&T side as well as in a lot of the exercises that are ongoing. And I think many are coming to realize that it's easy to say, very difficult to do. And it's all about, if I was to use General Van Herc as the commander of NORAD and NORTHCOM, it's all about defi- decision superiority. It's about getting the, the, the information that you need at the speed of relevance to the decision makers to have that operational advantage that I mentioned earlier on. As part of NORAD modernization, one of my projects is the future CAOC capability. So our new air operations center capability that's supposed to be delivered by 2030. Within that construct, we're looking at how we bring in JADC2 in, or at least a component of it into there to make sure that we look not just at the air domain, but all domains. Everybody wants to have access to all domain information. It's what, it, what do you need and how do you get it there? Often we talk about cloud-based computing and data. So it's about having access to the data, making sure that data is clean data that is able to be put together through machine learning, AI, and ultimately giving you that decision security that I mentioned earlier. So our chief information operations officer within the Department of Defense is working on several initiatives to give that for the Canadian Armed Forces. And within the Royal Canadian Air Force, we're working on cloud-based command and control, which is another NORAD modernization initiative. And then with our future CAOC capability combined, I'm we're looking to get after it. But what it will be is not really clear to me. And I think if you were to ask many people, they would give you a similar answer. You bet. I'm picking up on a theme that and maybe it's a product of our own success, but the Air Force and Space Force, we just seem so taken for granted, right? Everybody just expects us to be there. And I know we're getting tight on time, but I want to hit on this one directly with you, sir. And that's a large topic that I feel like we need to discuss, which is Northern Tier Defense. And we touched upon it, but I really want to get your thoughts on that directly. So in June of 2022, our Minister of Defense announced NORAD modernization. It's $38.6 billion over 20 years, 19 projects, 14 of them uh, fall to the Air Force to implement. This is about recapitalizing, modernizing our ability to detect, deter, and if required, defeat threats that are coming towards North America. One of the key priorities right now is being able to detect. We have the North Warning System, which was put in place in the 80s and is being uh, a certain level of modernization going to that. But it's not located at the right positions. What Russia can do with their long-range aviation, what they can do with their cruise missiles, has them much further out than we have those systems. So what we need is a new radar system or a new way of tracking, which does not have to be ground-based. Two of the projects that were announced as part of NORAD modernization are over the horizon radars. And we're working with the U.S. Air Force specifically to give 360-degree coverage of North America with over the horizon radars. Canada's contribution to that will be what's called over the horizon radar Arctic and over the horizon radar Polar. The Arctic radar will be situated in Ontario and will look to the north and towards the GI-UK position. And that is... A system that will be very similar to what is found in Australia. They refer to it as the JORN. It's a system that's steerable, that can look at long distances, bounces off the ionosphere to be able to track small items so that we can actually have a better idea of what the threats are that are around us. And we're looking at initial operational capability at 2030 for that one, covering 180-degree coverage. And then the second one that we're putting in, there's actually two with that one, but the second the other one that we're putting in is in the polar. So in the most northern portions of Canada, we have Canadian Forces Station Alert, it's the highest location that is manned within the Arctic, north of Thule, just to give you a bit of a sense of how far up it is. Up in that area, we're going to be putting in another over the horizon radar, which will be polar, and that will cover the polar region. And that's because the way the system works you actually have to be up in the pole to be able to, to effectively counter some of the challenges with the climate and the atmosphere specifically. So we need to have a separate system there. One of the challenges that's going to come with that is having the power to get up there and then pulling the data. So we're, we're working on that still. That's projected to be initial operational capability in 2032. So 
you need to be able to see the threats. You need to be able to deter them. That'll be F-35. That'll be the tankers that we're getting, and upgrades that we're doing to our air operations center and our air defense sector, bringing it together, cloud-based command and control, infrastructure. We have a significant amount of money that was announced as part of our modernization to upgrade our infrastructure at all our forward operating locations. We're also doing upgrades to our operational training infrastructure, which will bring us a fifth generation training range, primarily in Cold Lake, which I think will complement what the U.S. has in both Nellis Air Force Base, as well as Alaska near Isleson. For those that wish to do fifth generation training with fourth generation as well. And then we're also spending a lot of funds on upgrading the number of missiles that we have to a level, to be honest, that I haven't seen my entire career as a fighter pilot. And we're getting after a lot of the communications internally within Canada. So all that speaks to layered defense and ability to project power where required and ultimately to provide a sovereignty capability in close collaboration with NORAD. Well, thanks for that. I think you did an outstanding job of describing what is really the value of looking at these challenges from an aerospace perspective, where we blend the strengths from both domains to net a stronger set of solutions. So recognizing we're getting short on time, let me hand it over to Slick for our last question. One thing that we wanted to highlight here was that it is the Royal Canadian Air Force's 100th anniversary coming up on the horizon, and it's got to be a significant honor to lead the service at this juncture. It's really thought-provoking, reflecting on where the Royal Canadian Air Force has been and where it needs to go. So any thoughts you want to share on that front? Yeah, of course. 1 April 2024 is our centennial, 100th year of service for the Royal Canadian Air Force, and it's a real honor to be able to be the commander as we prepare for that celebration What we're looking at is to showcase, demonstrate, enhance, and honor. We're going to look at the service of those that have come before us since 1924. We're going to showcase those that are currently serving as aviators within the Royal Canadian Air Force. And then we're going to inspire towards our future, this modernized Air Force I talked to of 2035. We have many initiatives, plans, and programs in place. It'll start about six months prior, so later this year in the November to December time frame and go about six months past our birthday of 1 April 2024, so into the late summer. I invited many of my air chiefs to send some of their aerial demonstration teams over to participate in many air shows that we'll be doing across the country, and several of them have already re- responded with positive re- replies. We're doing everything from a gala to uh, a run, or movies, books, and uh, many different events to include, of course, hockey, because that's what we do in Canada, and So we have a partnership in place where we're going to be working with one of the hockey teams to really get after showcasing what we've done and where we're going. And then we've also have many science, technology, engineering, math, STEM initiatives ongoing to inspire some of those individuals who wish to join the Royal Canadian Air Force. I'm going to I'm going to leverage it a little bit to be a bit of a recruitment opportunity and attractions because I think as hopefully I described to you there there is lots to be excited about with the Royal Canadian Air Force. But we need the people to do it, and we need the right people to do it. So I'm very much looking forward to celebrating with all those that wish to participate on 1 April 2024 and the one year around that time. General Kenny, I really want to let you know just how much we appreciate your time today. And again, thanks so much for the collaboration and partnership, both on a national level as well as with the Mitchell Institute specifically. So really appreciate it and wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant General Deputula, as well as Slick. This has been fantastic. I look forward to coming back at some day in the future to tell you where we're at. Awesome, sir. Thanks so much for being here. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six. 